All right. Well, welcome back to the Bearbow Project. This is another short uh, video review episode. Um, I asked the parents of this young man, Logan, uh, if I could use him as an example um, of what is going on uh, with his shot and maybe talk about the things we're working on um, in order to help get him through a little bit of a rough patch. Um, I've been coaching Logan for quite some time. Logan is the first shooter that I coached that broke a national record. Um, he was like 11 years old and broke the Bowman um, Barebow indoor record during indoor nationals. Um, it might not have been indoor nationals, but it might've been like a Lancaster archery, you know, regular Starfita, indoor Starfita. Um, so, but Logan, you know, he comes and goes with some things because Logan takes some um, some medication for um, epilepsy, and he when he goes through medication changes and stuff, like we see differences in his response and his ability to concentrate and everything he's got going on. But the one thing that you know, is a, is a constant is that he loves archery and he continues to shoot despite, you know, maybe some performance peaks and valleys that you just can't, there's nothing you can do about. Um, it's just part of the process. So, you know, and I, I, I worked with Logan this weekend. I did some one-on-one -on -one with him um, because, because he has been struggling and because he is, um, going through some changes and he's growing uh <laughs> substantially um you know and going through changes his body's going through changes so things come up when you are coaching kids that you are out of your control and you need to just sort of navigate those situations as best you can um this is why as a coach it is so incredibly important that we teach our kids not to focus on score and strictly focus on um, the, the, the process side of shooting. Um, you can't take, you know, every single shooter and just tell them about, well, you just need to concentrate. You need to practice your concentration. Like that's not, that's not the sole answer to dealing with target panic. Logan's target panic, like I said, it comes and goes. When he is great, he's great, but when he as soon as he allows his mind to fluctuate over to thinking about score or thinking about an errant arrow or whatever he he gets really he's really hard on himself so but what we're working on is some of his tendencies with his shot process that causes or triggers the target panic per se um and I want you to pay attention to some things because there's a lot of things that happen in target panic that are the same effect, but a different symptom for different shooters. Logan gets, he has two things that he does. He gets stuck low. He gets stuck low because he's already thinking about letting go as the tip of the arrow comes to where he's to aim, or he gets it to the middle when he gets it, but, or he gets it to just below the middle and he holds, but then as he holds for a split second, it's not very long. He throws his hand up and tries to time the release. Um, that is a super, super, super common thing. I have gone through that myself. I really went through that um, with my form change for a little bit because I was trying to have this big fluid release that I used to have that was way back here. And it was one of these and it was real, look real pretty kind of, I guess, but it wasn't, it wasn't conducive to the bow arm that I needed to have. Um, I couldn't figure out, well, why is it, why is it that my bow arm stays really still on some shots even though I get it to the middle, but on other shots, it doesn't. It's because your body is constantly fighting to even everything out. Your body always wants to be centered. It always wants to be um, even on both sides, you know, and, and I've, I hone in on this. I talk about it a lot. 
I can't emphasize it enough, tension and direction. 50-50 tension and direction. Everything needs to be even or as close to even as possible. You wanna fight or combat your target panic? This is the way to do it. You need to dial everything back. Now, this is a video of Logan um, a few minutes into shooting. Um, it was It's actually, this was not as bad as some of his other shots. By the time he was done, um, we really dialed back his movement and focused on his bow arm. <clears throat> so I'm gonna play this through. I want you to watch Logan's movement. Okay, let's watch it again. And one more time. So there's a lot of things that are going on here. A lot of things that um, we, we have made changes with uh, in Logan in recent weeks. Um, and I'm going to be wor working with Logan a little bit more one-on-one -on -one here in the next couple of days. Logan, Logan previous to this was grabbing the bow tremendously. We since Relax the thumb. See how the thumb is now pointed toward the target. Um, and if I annotate that, stand by one second. I can use my favorite color green. This thumb used to be down this way. And that's no longer there. Um, made a huge difference. Now he has his hand in this position with his fingers relaxed but they're curled off to the side. It helps prevent um, that grabbing of the front bow tremendously. Again, this is another one of the reasons why I emphasize you need to have a finger sling so that you can allow, you can relax that hand completely and allow those fingers to fall to the side of the riser, keeping that 45 degree angle. Um, so I guess I'm using my right hand for some reason. I'm, I'm left hand, I'm right handed, so it'd be my left hand. But keeping that 45 degree angle, letting these fingers completely relax. Remember, when you have a relaxed hand, this isn't a relaxed hand. Finger straight is not a relaxed hand. A relaxed hand, you take your hand and just take all the tension out of it. What naturally happens? Your fingers, they, cl they collapse, they, but they're, they're in this relaxed position. The only part that's not relaxed in the shooter's bow hand is right here. It does make a, a, a difference. Excuse me for this quick commercial break, really just a communication with my wife. Yes, honey, I would love Duncan. <laughs> so, no, I will not edit that out. <laughs> um, you know, and that's one of the things that we've been working on. And I always, it's an, again, talking about negative tension. Any pressure you are putting into your grip, that includes the thumb um, here, here. Um, and I really wish I would have taken a video from the other side. This is literally the only clip I took. And then I messaged them and say, hey, you mind if I use Logan as a case study? Um, <clears throat> and then the other hand, whether it's around the front, um, really squeezing that, you know, that the grip, you know, the, the, this is this is the only place that you should really have any tension is where the grip is uh, making contact from your pivot here and then down to your pressure point. I still think I still think Logan's a little heavy on the grip, but you know it's not the end of the world. Um, <clears throat> all in all, you know his his this full draw position is not bad. You know, slight angle up, maybe a little more than I like, but it's not terrible. He's also like aiming down, so. That's part has a big crawl because he's aiming close. Um, but that's not, you know, not the end of the world. Shoulders are pretty level. This this one's up a little bit, but you know, again, there's in the world of things that to worry about, that is in this situation, that is not it. Um, it's getting him comfortable aiming again, um, working on the the movement, um, getting rid of the excessive movement when the shot breaks and what what the result of that is. So we're gonna to go to that point where, where Logan um, is shooting. All right, so you see that hand movement. Let's watch that again. Watch the hand movement, shoot straight up, boom. 
see that hand movement. We're gonna watch it one more time. Big jump, big jump. That hand, and we're gonna go back. I'm gonna pause it. We're going to create a line um, right where the top of the arm is, right here. I'm just gonna trace that. And we're gonna see how much movement happens after the shot breaks here, all right? Look at that. So what he's doing is he's getting to full draw. He's bringing the tip of the arrow to the six o'clock position on the dot. And when he does that, um, he gets just below, he gets just below that, that gold. And at the last second, he throws it to the aim point and then quickly lets go. So because he's using that visual as his right, what's happening on this shot, He's using that visual as the um, the reason, the trigger for him to let go. And we all know that that's not the right way to do it. And that you can, you absolutely can shoot decent scores with like little mini drive-bys. Just a little bit more than a mini. This is, this is, a, this is a high profile drive-by in, in my opinion. Um, so how do you get rid of that? and shoot a non-triggered shot. How do you dial this back and, and remove all of this excess movement and, and go and try to fix things? Well, again, we're going to go back to the full draw position because, you know, his full draw position is pretty good. He anchors a little further back, um, which is, is, which his anchor isn't bad. Um, I wish he was in the corner of his mouth, but he, we we haven't he hasn't mastered coiling at his waist in order to get to that position but he has improved it tremendously i'm not touching his anchor right now it's the least of important things his anchor is consistent it's not the end of the world um to each their own how they anchor i am a a, a significant fan of coiling anchoring in the corner of the mouth using the c of the hand with this behind the jaw so that when you anchor, you actually draw to load below your chin. And then this space right here splits the jaw and comes right into your anchor. You, you, it's, it's so consistent. It's incredibly consistent. Um, you know, he's on, he's got more of a Rick Stonebreaker anchor. He's on the side of his cheekbone there, but it's, it's a heavy anchor. And this is something that I have carried over from what I've learned or experienced as an Olympic recurve shooter, as well as compound, especially, is I'm not a fan of a heavy anchor. I'm not a fan of a lot of facial pressure. That affects your tune. That affects how you tune. Um, I'm more of a fan of light pressure, minimal at best. Um, just it's got to be super consistent. You can shoot with a heavy pressure in the side of your face and be consistent. It can be done. There's no question it can be done. Um, in my opinion, it's a higher volume of arrows to make that repeatable. So I try to navigate shooters to stay away from what has, what's going to take a higher volume of arrows to be repeatable and, 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 and move as far away from it as I can. Um, but, you know, a couple of things, you know, his hook isn't too bad. You can, you can see, you can see that his hook here really isn't too bad. He might be a little bit on the shallow end. Um, that might be something that we'll look at. Um, and you can also see, I'm going to draw, I'm going to go back a little bit before he's at full draw. We're going to go to the setup position. So right here, he's in the setup position. And as he comes in, you can see how he moves his face. Again, it's some, one of those things that I want to eventually try to get rid of, but he's developed these habits over time. And as we develop these habits, um, it's they're they're hard to break and at his age again this this stuff that i'm talking about right now has his consistency isn't good enough for this stuff to be, really have a reflection um you can still shoot 500 out of 600 indoor scores with this type of anchor with this other stuff going on at his face um, it's just not important right now because he needs to get comfortable holding again. And that's really the focus, but I'm going over it because I'm hoping to continue to work with Logan and work him through these issues and then 
for the rest of you to kind of follow along and see his transition. Right now, he's at a really good full draw position. He hasn't quite come into anchor. I'd like to bring this anchor down a little bit eventually and have that anchor come below the chin and then back into his anchor this way. Um, it's probably not the best motion. So it, draw so that the index finger comes right to the front of the chin and then split the jaw with the anchor and come into his anchor this way. That's, that's ultimately like in my best case scenario is the way I would try to transform him again at his age though. I'm not, I, it's, it's not right now at the situation. It's just not a priority priority is other things in regards to the facial pressure though. I will say this and, and you know, because of the negative tension topic, putting excessive pressure in places where we don't need it increases the likelihood of target panic. It's the same concept of shooting with both eyes open. It's the same concept of having, um, you know, not wanting your shoulder up, um, not hunching over, not bringing your head real far forward. It's the idea of you want stability and strength and, and as minimal attention as possible. So the maximum amount of tension that you want is tension that is necessary to be in a proper shooting position, nothing above that. The reason being, is because when it comes to tension and direction, we don't wanna create excessive stuff. So we want even amounts. And if I were to, you know, I don't know how else to do this, draw a line down, that's a terrible line. Let's try that again. So if we were to draw a line down the middle of Logan like this, it's probably not the best, but it's not too bad. Um, we want 50-50. We want 50 and 50, right? That's what we want. And that's <laughs> nice, nice zero. We want 50-50. So in order to create that, we need to reduce the movement here and reduce the movement here upon release. That's that's what we need. Um, how how do you accomplish that, or what do you do? Well, this I'm gonna I'm gonna play this real quick, and I want you to watch his release. So you can see that he is intentionally. Uh, this release actually wasn't that bad compared to. Um, some of his other releases. I wish that you saw his release when he first came in. His release was coming like, like it was like way back here and he was stopping way back here at his shoulder. And he, this specific shot, he's trying to reduce the movement and he actually doesn't do a terrible job. I mean, he loses posture in the hand, um, so you can see that it's it's not super repeatable, but I will take this release over the alternative. Um, hold on a second. So when he shoots, let's see if we can, he, he doesn't do too bad of a job of letting the string pull through. See this bow arm is still right now, head hasn't moved. Um, like this point in the shot where he lets go, looks good but the problem is is that he already started moving and you can't see that in this frame as soon as i hit play that bow arm's going to jump up because to him during aiming he's only moving it this far but it's it's right it's, it's riding up and he's moving it last last second right as it's going to let go because he's trying to get it to where that aim point is and that's what we have to get rid of so the goal, and this is one of the reasons that like a static, like a true static release can actually work in barebow, but a true static release, the problem with a true static release is you're not succumbing, you're not utilizing the back tension to its full capacity. The amount of movement that, that you will, should see in a release is just the release of tension from the string. So when you are here, and that string breaks, it's just allowing it to finish. The tension here, the tension you have in your back pulls it and that's it. That's where it ends. Not adding 
all this extra stuff because when we add all this extra stuff, it's going to want to naturally happen on the opposite side. The trick to dealing with target panic people is simplifying your shop process. Less is more. Get rid of all of the extra stuff that you do. Get rid of the extra negative tension. Get rid of all of the extra movement and let, as John Demmer says, enjoy the aim. Enjoy the hold and let the bow do its work so that you don't have to. Allowing that string to pull through does that, you know? Um, you know, and I'll, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this is one of the reasons that shooting with the thumb has become so popular because it takes the challenge in some ways, not some ways, I think it legitimately does. It takes the challenge out of aiming, um, but it's hard, it, it can be harder to repeat. You can hold because it's like holding a hinge at full draw. It's literally like holding a hinge of a compound at full draw so that that string can pull through when it pulls through. Um, but it's not super repeatable and it's not good for alignment purposes because you have to anchor way back here to get to alignment and you're overdrawing and like, it's just, it's real, it's real wonky. And I, I don't think you'll ever see a 550, 560, 570 shooter shoot that way. Um, it's one of those things that you, and I could be wrong. Somebody can prove me wrong, but until that happens, I'm going to stick by it, by, by what I'm saying. The, the goal is to reduce all of, reduce all of the movement in the shot. Um, let the body do the job that it, that it has the capability of doing by, you know, um, doing, perfecting the alignment, um, letting the string do the work and just reducing all of the excessive movement throughout the entire shot process. Establish the barrel of the gun early from there to there, have that straight line, establish the barrel of the gun early, maintain the barrel of the gun throughout until after the shot breaks. Maintaining the barrel of the gun means that all of your, this should not change, both not up, barely down, really nowhere. Um, it should, if anything, you should be relaxed enough here to allow the bow to shoot forward just a little bit whatever space you have left in the um, finger sling, this arm doesn't move and this only goes to where the tension um, allows it to go that you had on the string and that's it. Relax after that. Um, it's, it's hard to do. It is super, super hard to do it. It took me two years to honestly, to figure it out and understand it. And now that I'm seeing it I, I, and I'll tell you, I'm going to put, uh, Jamie Di Di Giacomo and her parents, um, who are, are a shooter of mine, she just turned 12. She's young cub class. She missed six, 600 this week. Or no, she shot a 600 on her second half, I think. Um, she shot like a 11, I'm going to say 1169 or something for a double 72 FIDA at 12 years old. Um, she, she very likely will, will, will serve or surpass the 1200 score for a double 72 for 144 arrow round um, this year at some point in time. She may even get upwards to, you know, uh, 620s. Um, if she continues, this is one of the major changes that we have changed with her is her draw process, her entire setup changes it all to help her get into that position. And that's kind of what we're working on with, with Logan but getting him comfortable with the point on, holding it, reducing this movement so that we can reduce this movement over here. So that, and, and, and for those of you who are listening to this, reducing or getting rid of completely the, the bow hand movement after the shot breaks and reducing the release hand movement only to what is a result of releasing the string. Get rid, getting rid of all of that so that we can concentrate on holding, so that we can concentrate on the tension in our fingers. Now think about this. If we are concentrating on allowing our hand to stay still, and we're concentrating on the tension 
that is on our fingers, we don't have time to concentrate on what's happening at the target. We don't have to worry about the tip of the arrow. We don't have to worry about aiming. Aiming only starts when expansion begins. That's it. That is it. You don't start aiming. Same for compound, same for Olympic recurve, same for bare bow. You don't even worry about aiming. Yeah, you might put it in the area, but you're not actually aiming. Don't even worry about it. Get it in the area, let it float, enjoy it, but don't, don't overanalyze it. Concentrate on the tension. Concentrate on the hold. The moment, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna close this uh, annotation out. I'm gonna go back to his full drop position. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Keep in mind, he's he's shooting blind bail here. Um, you hit right now shooting blind bail. He's visualizing aiming at the bottom of the gold the way he would at 18 meters. What you do or the thing that allows that break to happen for the string to come through the fingers is that as the tip of the arrow floats, and I see this target over here, as the tip of the arrow floats back and forth, you know, figure eight-ish somewhere in there, and that you're still holding, 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 holding. That's, if your mantra, whatever your mantra is, if you use one, if that's what you do, use that mantra um, but you, your focus, at least it is for me in some ways, is the tension that's on my fingers, allowing the aim to happen. Focus on the tension on the fingers, allowing the aim to happen. I'm almost visualizing in advance what I want my form to feel like at the end. I'm sort of like mentally preparing myself for that exact same feel. I am mentally preparing myself for that same finished position after the shot i know as soon as the shot breaks and where i finish on my on my um form i know before the arrow gets there where it's going to go because i am preparing myself to subconsciously allow that to happen that's where the, the conscious to subconscious switch happens that's where my my ability to allow my body's repeatability allow my body's um, innate ability with just uh, an infinite amount of, of repeatability to happen by going off of feel. That's how that transpires. That's how that rolls over to shooting and actually working live. You know, Santo Armano Armar happened to be at the range while I was working with him, you know, and Santo said, like, we're, we're chatting about it. And he's like, he's like, you can tell, like, when the when that light bulb goes on and 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 that was happening with logan um toward the end of our lesson this is this is super super important information people i hope that this helps you um and you know work on that the best drill it's on our youtube page um you should pro I'll put that in the com uh, not in the comments in the details of the video um, that drill is super, super helpful in order to accomplish this right here. This is where this is this is the reason um, that going with you know grip sears and tab sears and creating all of that tension. This is the reason why I struggle to um, support that. It works. They work. There's no question. They work. Um, they will work and you will, you will have a level of consistency. However, when you see guys like John um, and how John shoots, which is very similar to what I'm describing here, um, you know, there's a reason he shoots because he's, he's really using the ultimate feel of his body, the repeatability of his, of his shot process to be the thing that makes him consistent. That's why he shoots so high. Anybody can do that. Don't ever let someone tell you you can't shoot that good. Because if you tell yourself you can't, you won't. Um, but you have to be prepared to adopt the things that promote that type of shooting and do the drills and the work and the volume of arrows in order to get there. You can either take a shortcut and use something for, um, for some decent results, or you could really hone in on trying to become an elite level shooter, that's up to you. I find it with kids, especially 
if I teach them that way from the beginning, there's no negative to that. They get to, they are learning the proper way to shoot bare bow and then they can choose to do what, what with it, what they want as they get older. Hopefully we can teach them to shoot, um, you know, and they, they never have to go that route. So, all right, guys and girls, thanks for watching. Uh, appreciate you guys following the Barebow Projects and make sure you check out our sponsors, uh, Arizona Archery Enterprises, mostly known as AAE, Yager Archery Products. Uh, Paul Yager, thank you so much for your support. Not just myself, but also my shooters. Um, XS Wings, Ben Starr, absolutely the only being that I shoot. Um, and, uh, you know, the one and only Yoast Archery Products, Eric and Tracy Yoast, they're some of my favorite barebow people, I'm not going to lie. And our new sponsor, uh, One More Arrow, Martino Galante, he's actually a local guy, One More Arrow is an, uh, an archery brand, he sells some awesome apparel, go check them out at onemorearrow.com. Thanks guys. <laughs>